Hello everyone, my name is Grace Fulmer and I am the Community Watershed Specialist with Water Resources Research Institute. And I wanna thank you for joining this training today. I will be leading this online recording of the North Carolina Riparian Buffer Rules training. My team and I want to thank you for joining today. For a little background, this training was developed in partnership with North Carolina Division of Water Resources, North Carolina State University, North Carolina Forest Service, and Water Resources Research Institute. This training is going to be self-guided, so please make sure to grab your pen and paper to take notes. There's also going to be opportunities to have some self-reflection time, so it will be handy to have the, the paper and note. So please sit back and enjoy the training. So to start off, I'm going to share some of the objectives for the training today. The first one that we have is to build a deeper understanding of the North Carolina riparian buffer rules and how they apply within your local community. Following that, we have to be better prepared to apply what you learn in this training to the buffer programs that you work in. And finally, to learn from one another and to have an opportunity to network with these professionals. We have, as I said, a variety of speakers today. So to start us off, we're going to hear from Mike Burchill with NCSU presenting on riparian buffers for water resource protection. Then we have Sue Homewood with DWR presenting on Buffer Rules 101. Following that, we have Paul Wojowski with DWR talking about buffer authorizations. Patrick Beggs with DWR presenting on nutrient management strategies. Tom Giroux with the North Carolina Forest Service presenting on forestry practices. Nikki Mayer with Ordinance Compliance and Enforcement Overview. And Christy Perrin presenting on education and outreach and life beyond this webinar. So without further ado, we are going to get started with our first presenter. Um, first up, we have Mike Birchall, who will be presenting on riparian buffers for water resource protection. Mike is a professor and extension leader in the Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering at North Carolina State University. Since 2003, he has been involved in research, outreach, and teaching in the areas of wetland restoration, riparian buffers, constructed wetlands, innovative methods for stormwater treatment, and agricultural drainage water management. One of his main program goals is to improve design and implementation techniques of ecological engineering projects to maximize ecosystem services, particularly water quality improvement. He currently serves as vice president and president elect for the American Ecological Engineering Society. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I've had a chance to meet a handful of you in the break, breakout, but uh, it's, it's good to be here today. Um, you know, as we get started with these buffer rules, you know, one of the one of the first questions many people ask is, you know, really what good are riparian buffers? And so communicating their benefits truly is a crucial first step in being able to promoting, you know, the understanding by not only those that are, that are having to implement these rules, but for those that are going to be affected by these rules. So my goal today is to quickly make sure we're all on the same page about the overall benefits associated with, with property buffers. So, you know, what we're talking about are these riparian areas or areas near water bodies, streamside corridors, they're called floodplains. Um, they've long been recognized as being unique and beneficial to the environment. I mean, anytime you've got a, a, a Latin prefix in, in the name, that means it's been around and recognized for a, a long time. In this case, the, case, the, the Latin term riper. Uh, and originally, most of the floodplains, you know, before, you know, these areas were developed, most of them were well vegetated, mostly forested. And we talk about these things in the ecological community as being an ecotone. And it's a transitional area from the upland to the, um, to the aquatic. And in many ways, it acts like a cell membrane in controlling how materials enter the, enter the stream. And the materials are, 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 there's many types of different materials that are actually moving in and out of these streams. So 
Um, you know, we in today's vernacular, we call these vegetated streamside areas riparian buffers, and, and we use this buffer term to, to designate that we're either strategically protecting them or strategically redesigning them to provide us benefits. And we've been talking about buffers for a long time now. Um, uh, here we show kind of an idealized schematic of a three zone riparian buffer that's usually recommended by agencies like the Natural Resource Conservation Service. They're involved in conservation programs. Uh, but, you know, buffer experts have been working both national and, and, and at NC State plus state officials in joining together to try to determine what a realistic buffer width needed to be to minimize the land that actually needed to be put into buffers and still get some sort of benefit. And the result in most watersheds in North Carolina is this uh, minimum 50 feet. Uh, and because it's so narrow, we've, we've decided that, you know, the minimum um, width here only allows for maybe two zones here, maybe a grass buffer uh, in the most uplands area um, and uh, more hardwood trees that are near the stream. So there are literally hundreds of articles in scientific journals and extension fact sheets um, that show that buffers can provide, I think it can be boiled down to four functions. The first function is to protect, protect the stream structure itself. So imagine if you would, the vegetation around the buffer slows surface water that runs down toward the stream, okay? Uh, and the roots near the stream, uh, embedded in the stream bank, actually stabilize those banks, particularly in the bends where the velocity can be the, the highest in these streams. And so when you slow runoff and reinforce the stream banks, you get less erosion, not only in the sloped buffered areas, where you're not getting sediment in deposited in the stream, but you're also reducing velocity um, in the stream stabilizing that so you have less stream bank erosion there um, depositing stream of uh, sediment in the stream and so the less buffer and stream bank erosion you have the less sediment loss you have downstream and sediment is particularly important in north carolina it's usually listed as the number one uh, pollutant and responsible for a stream degradation buffers enhance the aquatic environment uh, in several ways. It's all a lot of it's tied to trees. The tree canopies that you saw there in the idealized buffer schematic, uh, they provide shade, which provides temperature control to the stream. Um, the lower the stream temperature, the higher that the stream has the ability to hold dissolved oxygen to support the fish and other uh, macroinvertebrates that live there. And the shade tends to control algal blooms when you do have uh, high nitrogen and phosphorus conditions. The leaf litter and the coarse woody de debris um, work together in providing carbon and other organic nutrients that are important for energy in the bottom of the food web and is important uh, for things like macroinvertebrates, uh, like this dragonfly larva here. And the coarse woody debris provides habitat for these macroinvertebrates and fish and amphibians and whoever wants to live in those streams. Now here's an example of how shading near the stream impacts stream temperature. Um, if you look at the left part of the graph here, uh, you see water temperature and distance from the spring head. In this area, the area was clear cut. You can see that the water temperature quickly rise to about 65 degrees in this mountain stream. And then as you make your way down the stream back to a completely canopy and forested uh, system, you can see that the water temperature is as much as 10 degrees cooler, only 3,000 feet away. And so that's pretty important um, here. And remember, lower temperature, more dissolved oxygen capacity, important in all streams, but particularly in our uh, uh, Western streams that have um, um, fish like trout that are very sensitive to dissolved oxygen, low dissolved oxygen. So the third thing that buffers do is to reduce sediment and phosphorus from surface runoff. We're going to talk about two types of, of, of water here. We're going to talk about surface water and strategies that remove pollutants from there and groundwater and strategies that we use to remove pollutants uh, from the groundwater. So <clears throat> all of these improvements to water quality in a watershed is what really drives the majority of buffer rules. It's about water quality. Um, so starting with
with surface here, surface water, we could generally um, remove and predominantly reduce sediment and sediment-borne phosphorus that is coming in uh, from the upland into the buffer. And so in a two or even three zone buffer, a strategically placed and well-maintained grass buffer at the upland that could be comprised of fescue, mixed clover, Bermuda grass, switchgrass, whatever, uh, just a well-maintained, complete grass system will um, slow down the water, increase diffuse flow of the water, making it thinner and spread out. That's a critical component there. <clears throat> and as that water slows down, whatever sediment and sediment bound phosphorus there can be deposited in that grass area. There it's trapped, it doesn't make its way all the way to the stream. And actually some of the phosphorus that's left behind can be taken up by some of the plants in the grass buffer or some that makes it down into the forested area. So sediment reduction can be really high. It's generally never 100%. Uh, the amount of sediment removal is a function of source. And when I say source, how much sediment is actually in the surface water? The width of the buffer and the slope of the buffer, those are kind of intuitive, right? If you've got a, um, a steeper slope, you would potentially need a wider grass buffer to slow that water down. Um, and you can see as much as 60 to 90 percent. In this graph here, you can show it shows the difference in reduction between a coastal plain um, grass buffer. You can see 70 to 85 percent in only 14 feet. And that's because those buffers are flatter. Um, and thus like a 15 foot grass buffer might be effective there. But in the Piedmont, when you have more slope, you need a slightly wider um, buffer to actually maintain and get upwards of 70, 80% of sediment reduction. Uh, but also pointed out here that additional doubling the width really doesn't do much for the uh, reduction in the coastal plain in the yellow bars there. There's a point of diminishing term really there. Um, so since phosphorus is associated with the sediment, the same concept applies. In this case, about 60% of the phosphorus is removed, you can see in the uh, first 15. And then um, uh, the removal continues to increase, but at a, uh, a much slower rate. So that's surface water. So what about groundwater? Well, what we're generally, our strategy um, to remove nutrients with groundwater is generally centered around nitrate and nitrogen. Um, and so riparian buffers can be effective sinks of nitrogen, of nitrate through microbial denitrification and um, plant uptake. What's generally happening in the upland is that like in a, in a uh, agricultural setting, Fertilizers that are usually applied as ammonium or ammonium nitrate, microorganisms in aerobic soil convert most of that to nitrate. And nitrate's much more mobile, and that's the form of nitrogen that actually makes its way in the groundwater and discharges into those streams. But with buffers in the way, we can actually reduce some of that nitrate before it moves into the streams. And the reason the buffer can be good at this is is because you generally have high plant productivity, which benefits actual plant uptake of the nitrate. And, um, and, it had, and you have um, roots there that um, help microbial denitrification because that's where the microbes reside. And then there's other conditions that favor this denitrification, high water table, high soil carbon, and low soil oxygen. And all of those components are important for denitrification because in the absence of oxygen in many of these areas, where these wetter areas are close to the stream, soil microbes like to use nitrate instead of oxygen for their respiration uh, and release that nitrate to the atmosphere. So in nitrogen removal, water table, having the water table near the surface is key. Again, if the roots can encounter the nitrate uh, because they're, the water table is close, they can have direct uptake, if it's close to the surface, you have uh, less soil oxygen, and so microbes start to want to uh, convert that nitrate into oxygen in their respiration. And then you can, those two things combine for significant potential removal of, of nitrogen. And studies vary, but mostly show about 30 to 90% of nitrate 
reduction in properly sized buffers. Now, there's a lot of factors that govern this. Again, is there actually a source of nitrate coming into the buffer? What depth of that groundwater is? Is the stream in size that will typically drop the groundwater? And is there enough soil carbon in the buffer? But generally, you get some removal. We've done some studies in North Carolina. Uh, back in the uh, mid-2000s, we studied the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program buffers in the Tarpan Basin. And generally, the way that we did this is we would install dozens of groundwater uh, wells along transects from the field to stream edge and measure nitrate concentrations along with other parameters as the groundwater moved through these buffers. In one example of these um, studies, we had an agricultural land that uh, groundwater moved in this direction through two different buffers here. And in section one, the groundwater um, moved through at four milligrams per liter and down here at 12 milligrams per liter. And so we showed, we showed differences in nitrate reduction. Uh, section one had 63%, while section two had about 89%, but had a lot more nitrate coming into the buffer and I can tell you that that section two was also wet. And so it had more of those conditions that were conducive uh, for uh, more nitrogen removal. So just an example about how you may see differing uh, amounts of nitrate removed in your buffer, but generally so. So in conclusions, if you ever, if you ever find yourself in, a, uh, in an elevator or out in the field with somebody who's uh, kind of a, a buffer naysayer, you can tell them that the riparian buffers are important because they protect stream structure, enhance the aquatic environment, reduce sediment and phosphorus from surface runoff, and reduce nitrate, nitrate, uh, nitrate and nitrogen from groundwater before it discharges to the stream. Now, keep in mind, often buffers will provide most of these important functions at all sites. And research strongly supports the fact that buffers are really a critical component for successful water quality protection strategy in North Carolina. Overall, I think that Research shows that most of these buffer functions, particularly for water quality, approach a maximum at about 100 feet um, and then start to diminish at different rates as buffers get more narrow. Um, and, you know, there's often talk about, hey, maybe 50 foot is even too much uh, buffers for current development um, areas. But really, if we reduce it, research shows that if we reduce it, any past 50, we could significantly reduce the effectiveness, particularly of nitrogen removal, um, because you'd have less treatment area and sediment re removal, particularly in lands with higher slopes. So with that, I know that's a lot to kind of digest. Hopefully it was uh, somewhat of a review for a lot of you, but um, I'll stop there and I guess we'll have some time to answer questions a little bit later. We are now going to hear from Sue Homewood presenting on Buffer Rules 101. Sue has been employed by the North Carolina Division of Water Quality and Resources since 1996. She began her career in the central office and in 2004 relocated to the Winston-Salem Regional Office. Sue's primary responsibilities include all things stream, buffer, and wetland related, including determinations, permitting, compliance, response to complaints, and providing technical assistance to homeowners, developers, industry, government agencies, and North Carolina citizens. Sue has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Engineering from Winslayer Polytechnic Institute and a Master's of Science in Environmental Engineering from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am just going to do a quick um, refresher for some or introduction for others. Um, it, it's the very, very basics of the buffer rules. We could do a whole day of talks and get down into the weeds, but um, we just want to get everybody on the same page um, as we're going forward. So in North Carolina, um, we have six riparian buffer protection programs. They range from the um, Noose and Tarpan, which are very large, to the um, Randleman and the teeny tiny Goose Creek. Um, and they go from the coast to almost the mountains. The Catawba tries to peek into the mountains and the foothills. The purpose of the different buffer rules is, is different in each watershed. Um, in the Noose, Tarpan, and Catawba, the purpose of the buffer rules was set out to provide nutrient removal functions to protect estuaries and downstream lakes. Um, 
Sometimes that gets misconstrued as they were developed to improve the function or the uh, conditions of those features. Um, it was more of a to stop the, the problem or to slow the process down. Um, so hopefully they've been providing some additional protection so that our water quality stayed um, static or at least didn't decline as quickly. Um, they were never thought to be the, the fix to some of our water quality problems in North Carolina. Um, in Randleman Lake and Jordan Lake, those buffer rules are specific to protecting water supplies. Both of those lakes are water supplies for multiple municipalities. Um, Randleman Lake, the buffer rules were put into place at the time the lake was being built. So the hope was that it would help that water quality um, from the start. And for Jordan Lake, it's once things got bad enough, they put in um, any kind of measures they could to, again, pr protect things from getting worse. Um, Goose Creek is a little different. Those buffer rules were developed to sustain and recover a federally endangered Carolina heel splitter, which is a mussel species. Um, and that's sort of why it's so small. That is the only area that, um, that needs to be protected for that endangered heel splitter. So buffer rules are implemented. Um, the, the rules are delegated to the Division of Water Resources to um, develop and implement. In some watersheds, um, local governments may request delegation. So um, in New and Tarpam and Catawba and Goose Creek, local governments can say, hey, we're already doing a lot of our planning and regulatory work through our ordinances and we'll take the buffers and handle those. Uh, Jordan and Randleman are a little different. When those buffer rules were developed, it was mandated that the local governments be the authority to implement those buffer rules. There were some exceptions, um, and those are listed here, forestry, government projects, agriculture, and projects that might cross um, boundaries between different municipalities. So in those cases, the state, the Division of Water Resources will um, implement the buffer rules and maintain jurisdiction. If you read the buffer rules, the term we use is the authority, and that's because it was complicated to write in the state or a local government. So we just um, used the phrase authority, and that's defined in the buffer rules as the entity who has been delegated or designated to implement the buffer rules. So um, for the buffer rules to apply uh, in most of the program, the six programs, um, the features have to be approximately shown on either the latest USGS topo map, and that's the one online. Um, it has a national hydrologic data set in the, the um, the maps that are available from USGS online, or the most recent published soil survey. Now this is different because the published soil surveys are the old books that people um, have from the counties. Some of them are as old as the early 1900s. Um, online is a web soil survey. That does not have the same stream layers as the published soil survey. So you just have to be cautious if you are picking up using your computer to find all the maps. Um, the, the published soil surveys are all scanned in as PDFs, so you can still use the computer to find the right maps. Just make sure you're not going to the web soil survey because that won't give you the right information. Um, there are some caveats in some of the buffer rules in Randleman buffer rules. It's such a small watershed and it was so urban that they felt like even with the two maps combined, they were not capturing and protecting a good portion of the watershed. So there's a clause in there that says, the buffer rules apply if site-specific evidence indicates there's a stream. So basically what that means is if you have a stream and you drain to Randleman, it's got buffers on it. Um, in Catawba, the buffers only apply to the main stem Catawba River and the lakes from Lake James down. So that you don't need any maps. They're not in those rules. It doesn't reference these maps because it's just the main stem and the lakes. So once you figure out that a stream um, may show up on the map or in Randleman, it may be on the ground, the buffer rules apply to specific features and that's perennial or intermittent streams. And those are determined based on a, a Division of Water Resources stream identification manual. You don't necessarily use those maps to determine if it's intermittent or perennial. Um, they apply to lakes and reservoirs and ponds that are attached to streams, so ponds that are built by damming upstream, so a stream is feeding it or exiting the pond. It applies to the 
estuaries down in Noose and Tarpan, and it applies to modified natural streams. So even if it's maybe not in the same location on the map, if you are sure that it was that stream that maybe has been moved to the edge of an ag field or moved to a roadside ditch to build a new road, it would still apply if you can identify that that's the stream that was on the map. Um, where it doesn't apply are ditches and man-made conveyances, um, unless on the coast they're constructed for navigation or boat access. And there are some ditches that are required to be buffers in Randleman. So I encourage you, if you work in the Randleman watershed, to um, open that up and read it because some ditches are, right, are buffered. It does not apply to ephemeral streams. Um, and a lot of people will say, what's the difference between the ephemeral stream and a ditch? Um, we consider the ditches as man-made features. Ephemeral streams are natural features that are just drainages not connected to the groundwater. Um, it does not apply to ponds that aren't connected to streams. So there are a lot of upland ponds in North Carolina dug for prior um, agriculture or just um, aesthetics. It wouldn't apply if it's not connected to a stream. The buffer rules do not apply to wetlands. You may have wetlands within a buffer, but we do not, these rules do not say you have to buffer wetlands. And um, they do not apply to ponds constructed and used for agricultural purposes, and that's defined now in the rules. Once you figured out if the stream has a buffer, how big is the buffer? Uh, in five of the buffer rules um, listed here, there is a 50 foot buffer on both sides of streams, lakes, ponds, or estuaries that starts at the top of bank or the normal water level if you're talking about an open water body. The first um, 30 feet is considered zone one and that is undisturbed vegetation, forest vegetation. So the trees are supposed to remain there except for certain uses, which I'll talk about. Zone two is the outer 20 feet, and that can be managed vegetation. So that could be um, woody vegetation, trees and shrubs, natural forest. It also could be just managed as grass or pasture or something like that. Um, but in total, 50 feet is protected. So um, anything that occurs in that 50 feet has to be something allowed by the buffer rules. Now in Goose Creek, that's the one oddity. Um, because that is so small and uh, federally endangered species is so dependent on the water quality there, those buffers are um, either 100 or 200 feet wide. It is always undisturbed forest vegetation. And the difference of um, the 100 and the 200 feet is whether you're inside or outside of the 100 year floodplain. So that one's very different in how you apply the width of the buffer. So we get a lot of questions about how do you measure the distance, um, the buffer distance? Um, do you measure horizontally when you're looking at a plan set or do you go out and topographically measure it with the lay of the land? The answer to that is you measure it um, horizontally as if you were a bird's eye view up above um, or you're looking at a plans that you're drawing out um, on a piece of paper. We get a lot of questions about where the top of bank is. Um, in the rules, it says the uh, either the top of the stream bank or the ordinary um, uh, uh, normal high water level of open waters, ponds and lakes. For streams, the top of bank can get kind of confusing, um, especially in the Piedmont where you have a lot of inside streams. So they're down deep in a gully. The stream is 15 feet down. Um, what we do there is apply the top of bank as sort of the normal water level where you don't see vegetation growing. So that's this, the picture on the bottom here. This is a four foot wide stream channel in a 15 foot wide gully. And that gully probably formed 50 years ago and it just can't recover. We don't apply the buffer at that top of bank where it starts to be horizontal. That's where a surveyor would normally call a top of bank and that's what gets confusing. Um, and that can make a big difference for some people. You can see that's you know, 11 foot difference. Um, so depending on where the buffer starts could affect a property significantly. Um, we get a lot of people who are, say, um, I thought the buffer started at the edge of coastal wetlands and they would be right um, previously. So when the Noose and Tar Pam rules were first written, 
there was a requirement that you took the open water body, then you attached any coastal wetlands, then you started the buffer. But a few years back, the General Assembly decided that that was just too difficult to work with um, and limiting a lot of people's use of their property. So now it is the normal water level. Um, and, and that is in the 20 coastal counties that, you, that have coastal wetlands defined in regulations. Um, that now begins at the most landward limit of the normal high water level, and they use field indicators to identify where that water line is because it fluctuates with the tide. Um, so if you're working with someone who's been around a while and knows the buffer rules from when they were first passed, just make sure that everybody's on the same page that that coastal wetlands requirement changed uh, maybe about five or six years ago. And another question we get is, where do you start measuring the buffer on the edge of a lake or a pond? And especially, what about a beaver impoundment? So the edge of the lake or the pond is the normal water level. That's often taken from taking an elevation of the dam structure, the outlet structure. What is the normal outlet? Um, not the fluctuation of the highest level it could be. Uh, also not the lowest level it could be in drought situations. So it's the, the normal um, outlet riser structure. In a beaver impoundment, we do the same thing. We take the elevation of the beaver dam, uh, which yes, can change over time, but we have to just apply it at the day that we're there. So what can you do in a buffer? Um, as I mentioned, zone one is um, specifically in the rules as a vegetated area to be undisturbed, except for items that are specifically listed out in the rules. Zone two actually says the same thing. It's supposed to be an undisturbed vegetated area, except for specific items outlined in the rules. But one of those items is that you can grade um, zone two, provided you are not compromising the vegetation in zone one, and you're not allowing stormwater um, to infiltrate zone one in a conveyed or a um, concentrated manner. So we get a lot of questions about what about pruning. Um, pruning is actually now defined in five of the six rules. Jordan doesn't have a definition, but we use the same definition as the other rules. And that's the removal of dead tree and shrub branches um, or live branches um, with a certain diameter tree or shrub. So it's spelled out differently for deciduous and coniferous trees and shrubs. I encourage you, if that question comes up, to go to the rules and specifically read the definition. It is very specific, um, and a lot of people take an aggressive approach to pruning that would not be allowed the way the rules are written. There is an allowance for existing and ongoing uses in the rules. Um, so this means if the activity was happening when the, when the rules were passed and it's continued to, to be maintained in that manner, then it's, um, you know, the old term would be grandfathered. It's allowed as an existing use. Now, each of the buffer rules have a different um, start date. So that existing use would be um, dependent on when the buffer rules were passed. Uh, and you'll see an asterisk here for Randleman and Jordan Lake. Because those rules were delegated to the local governments, it took each local government a different amount of time to draft up their ordinance and put them in place. So it would be the time, the date, when the ordinance went into place. And that was when the new rules would have been applicable to properties. Uh, keep in mind that only the portion of the buffer that contains the footprint of that use is exempt. So it doesn't mean the whole property is exempt. If someone had a mowed lawn um, and then they, they um, wanted to expand that, it, they, they can't do that um, just because it's on their property where they had some mowed lawn. It would only be the footprint that they were mowing at the time the buffer rules went into effect. And then um, all of the buffer rules have a table of uses. If you've used this before, you can um, try and pull out your hair sometimes trying to figure out how to navigate the table of uses. Um, they look a little different. We, um, we went through a rule revisions last year and I'll talk about some of that. And, and one thing we did was change how these tables um, were listed. So um, Jordan has some old language. The other five rules have some newer language. Um, they mean the same thing. The intent is if 
your activity is listed in the table of uses, you may be able to proceed. You may not need anything from the buffer implementing authority, the local government or the state. Um, but some activities are only allowable upon approval. So um, in some cases, you may be doing one of the activities in the table of uses, but it requires you to get approval first. And that approval process, um, Paul will speak to that a little bit. It, it just makes sure that the minimum um, impacts are occurring to the buffer. So back in um, last summer, we um, went, went through a multi-year process that finally came to an end in the summer of 2020. And that did um, revise five of the six buffer rules, all but Jordan. So um, the problem that happened is we started that process uh, a few years back and everybody got involved and then it sort of um, sat on a shelf for a little while and it just finalized last year. So it seems like it came out of nowhere to some people, but we had been working on it. It was just how long the procedure took to get through the process. And there was a long lag in that, the end of it. So people forgot that we were working on these. Um, our main goals when we took that, uh, undertook that um, process was to revise a lot of outdated requirements. Those new buffer rules were from the 90s, same with the Randleman rules. Um, and there were a lot of things we learned since then that we wanted to incorporate. There were a lot of um, stormwater um, improvements that we wanted to incorporate. So we did that. We took all of our rules and we sort of modified all the outdated stuff. What we had learned went into the new version of the rules. Um, we wanted to provide consistency between as many of the rules as we could, including some of our other regulations, such as stormwater or watershed protection rules, some of the federal regulations. We wanted to do as much as we could to provide the regulated community with consistency. We improved a lot of language, like I said, addressed some of the inconsistencies. There had been a lot of legislation over the years telling us how to interpret our rules or how to do them differently. So we incorporated all that into these new revisions. Um, and we tried to improve the, the process, the regulatory burden and the flexibility to the community. What didn't change um, as I mentioned, the Jordan Lake buffer rules did not go through this process, um, so they didn't change. They were the newest of our rules, so um, they had a lot of the improvements already in them. They just don't now look the same as the rest of them. Um, but also what didn't change is the each buffer rules scope, purpose, and applicability. So everything I just talked about, how you measure the buffers, where it applies in the specific buffer rules, what their purpose was, none of that changed. We really just changed more of the procedural stuff. Um, we kept the exist exemptions and existing uses. We kept the zone one and zone two, except for Goose Creek, which doesn't have zones. Um, we kept the table of uses, much to many people's dismay. Uh, we evaluated different ways of getting that information in there and the table of uses just uh, worked the best. And we did not change anything about which local governments were um, delegated, designated, how they go through that process, all of that remained the same. We um, clarified a few issues, but none of it really changed. So if somebody was delegated before, they kept their delegation, even though we had modified these rules. What really changed was the look and the location of these buffer rules. So um, we, in, in part of this process, we had to reorganize where they belonged in the North Carolina Administrative Code. So just an example, the news buffer rules used to be the O2B, O233 rules, um, and now they are in 714. So if you have, go, if you're used to using those citations, you'll have to go look for the new citations. Um, you can go to our website. This table, cross-reference table, is available on our website, and it just talks about where it was before and where it is now, in case you can't find it. Um, also, some of the rules were broken up into multiple rules, so everything in the news rules is now into four rules, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, what we did there is we got a lot of comments from the regulated community and people using these rules that it would be really nice if all the rules were the same. News to TARPAM. Um, in fact, in our breakout session, one of our, our people mentioned that, you know, there's all differences no matter where you go. 
we looked at that and we looked really carefully. Uh, it turns out that because they all have different purposes and slightly different applicabilities, it would be really hard to just have one buffer rule. Um, it ended up saying, except for here, except for there, except for here, and it turned out just as confusing. But what we did is identify the parts of those buffer rules that could be the same, and we took them out and put them into one place. So now there's one rule that, talk, that has our definitions. There's one rule that talks about how to get authorization certificates, approvals from the implementing authority, and Paul will talk a little bit about that process. And there's one location for forest harvesting requirements. So those were the same across all the buffer rules, and now they're not in the specific buffer rules, they're in their own rules. So if we change a definition, it'll change for everybody at the same time, and hopefully that'll help simplify it. And as I mentioned, we changed the um, table of uses. We changed just the, the categories, what we call them. We found that some of the category language, um, it was confusing to the users out there. So we tried to come up with some better terminology. Um, so everything that was exempt is now called deemed allowable. That's more of a term that the permitting world is used to, to hearing, deemed permitted, deemed approved. Um, and we clarified that allowable meant allowable upon getting a piece of paper from the authority, so upon authorization. Um, and we created a new category that's called allowable upon exception. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So this allowable upon exception, now for those of you who are in Jordan or work in the Jordan, just um, I know it's frustrating that not everything is the same, but in this case, Jordan doesn't have this because they didn't go through this rule revision with the other five. But what that is, is for any activity that's not listed in the table of uses, we just couldn't think of it because it's a once or twice occurrence. Um, things in the table of uses are things that happen all the time, roads and um, forestry activities and people wanting to put in utility lines. But this is for things that we didn't think of. Um, so if it's not in the table of uses, it used to be prohibited automatically, and you had to go through this long variance process, which included going to our Environmental Management Commission, which was a long scheduling process more than anything. So we now have this allowable upon exception, which keeps a lot of the criteria the same, but changes the process so it's simpler. So those people have to show that there are hardships. Um, why do you need to do this activity? Um, there are steps that are outlined. You have to, to meet those requirements. Um, and there is mitigation required, which means you will um, pay into a fund that will support and protect and restore buffers elsewhere. But the process can be approved by the implementing authority. So that means either the Division of Water Resources of, or the local government. What we did was take out the step where it goes to our Environmental Management Commission, and that was what was taking the longest. So we decided that staff could go through this process. The criteria is spelled out pretty clearly in the rule. Um, we differentiated between minor and major exceptions. So how much buffer impact there is, determines whether it's the simpler minor exception or the slightly more complicated major exception. Um, major exceptions will have to go out to public notice. That's the biggest difference. Now, one thing to note, and I, I highlighted that the exceptions are approved by the implementing authority. While the rule says this, um, local governments still have to follow the current ordinances. And those ordinances all probably still say variances are required. So until local governments have a reason or need to update their ordinances, there might be some a period of time where they have to follow a variance process, even though the state rules are a little um, less requirements um, for this exception. And we can work with local governments if that comes up. Luckily, variances aren't all that common, um, especially now we've expanded some of the table of uses to add a few things that we were seeing all the time. So those won't trigger variances. But if it does, we can work with all parties involved to sort of navigate this process. The take home is it's, a, it's the same process or the same requirements, a different process and a little faster and simpler to get through the process. Whether that ends up in approval or not, that's a different story, but the process itself has been simplified. 
So like I said, we did do some table of uses updates. Um, table of uses used to have pages of footnotes. That was too hard for people to go find those. Um, so we incorporated them into the table itself, made the table look a little longer and a little scarier, but now you only have to go to one place. Um, similar items were combined together. Again, that, that helped. Now, what I will say is the table is alphabetical, but it might be alphabetical under, in this example, roads. And you might have a bridge or a driveway or a sidewalk or a greenway, and you're looking for those things. And if you don't know the first word we used, you won't know where to look in the table. So it is a good idea to go through every item and make sure you found the item where your project fits. Um, we made significant changes to allowances for residential properties and structures. And that was based on legislation that had passed over the years. We just incorporated that into the buck rules. So there's a lot more allowed in the table of uses for um, residential properties that had been platted before the buffer rules went into a place. It, um, we expanded some of the allowances for stormwater control measures, um, and we made significant updates and revisions to the utility line uses in the table of uses. Um, they, they weren't covering all the utility situations, and those are just a dime a dozen, to be honest. So we expanded that so that we could try and cover as much as what we could think of. So just real quick about the, the stormwater changes. Um, most of you are probably, if you've worked with the buffer rules, familiar with the term diffuse flow. That started back in the new rules um, in the 90s. That term's not really used in the stormwater world these days. Um, and stormwater management has developed significantly in 20 years. So we tried to update our stormwater requirement um, in the buffer rules. Now we're just calling it stormwater runoff through the buffer. And we um, changed the terminology of diffuse flow to dispersed flow because that is now a defined term in our stormwater regulations. And we actually cited the stormwater regulations. So over the years, there's been a lot of strain on the regulated community to to work with a buffer or a buffer program that refers to stormwater in one way and a stormwater program that refers to stormwater and, and provides allowances differently. We tried to merge the two as much as possible. So you'll see we reference a lot of the terminology and requirements in the stormwater rules themselves. That way, if they change, the buffer rules will update automatically. Um, we allow conveyances from treatment systems. That was something that wasn't in the buffer rules. Now it's very clear that if, if you're doing treatment, that conveyance um, can, can be in the buffer without added approvals. And we allowed for some situations like minor discharges through the buffer of stormwater when you can show that it's not um, increasing nutrient loads to the water feature, to the to the stream or the estuary. Um, we uh, allowed for situations where it's a small amount of flow and it wouldn't be erosive to not have to do this dispersed flow that you, that you may be able to convey small amounts of flow. We talk about allowing for realignment of conveyances. So it's stuff we had come across over the years that the previous rules language weren't allowing us to be flexible enough. So we tried to incorporate everything we had learned. And we also incorporated a little flexibility in saying, if there's something we haven't thought of, it can be dealt with through the allowable upon exception process so that it didn't automatically become prohibited. So I would say that the stormwater is one of the biggest things we updated and hopefully for the best for everybody out there. And that is my last slide, Grace. I'll turn it back over to you. So I hope that these first few presentations have been educational and informative. If you have any questions, you can email or call these presenters with the information that they have provided. And I'm sure they will be happy to answer your questions. So before we move on to the next presentation, I wanna give some time to have a little sort of interactive activity. Um, I would love it if you could take some time to grab your pen and your paper and reflect on what you have learned so far. Maybe write down a few bullet points. Um, so something that you have learned so far or something that has surprised you. Please take a few minutes to write that down.
Thank you for doing that activity. So we're going to move right along with the next presentation. Now we are going to hear from Paul Wojcicki presenting on buffer authorizations. Paul is the supervisor of the 401 and buffer permitting branch within NCDWR. This branch includes the 401 water quality certification program, the isolated wetlands waters program, the riparian buffer protection program, and the stream wetland nutrient offset and riparian buffer mitigation programs. Previously, he worked as a senior environmental specialist for the branch, coordinating the 401 water quality certification and buffer permitting programs. Mr. Wojcicki carries a Bachelor of Science in Biology with emphasis in computational science from Wilford College. His experience includes environmental consulting in the private sector, organizing with environmental nonprofits, and 10 years of environmental regulation experience, including five years in coastal wetland management with the state of South Carolina. Well, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I, I'm happy to be here. I appreciate that warm introduction, Grace. Um, I, I welcome the opportunity to, to be able to talk here this morning and, and speak with folks about the riparian buffer rules because of um, we're always working in an effort to provide more information and clearer information out there uh, about these rule sets and, and to help consultants and local governments who have to work with them every day. And so what I'm going to do here in, in my presentation is actually I'm going to dive a little bit deeper. Um, I'm going to build off what you've heard from Dr. Birchall and Ms. Homewood so far and, and dive a little bit deeper into the actual nuts and bolts of reviewing buffer authorizations and issuing approval uh, for, for buffer impacts. I want to touch on how the buffer authorizations uh, overlap a little bit with 401s um, and also how to submit applications, what to look for when reviewing applications, what DDVR will look for, um, and what local authorities uh, may be looking for in their delegated programs or designated programs. I'm also going to touch on uh, exceptions and variances very briefly to build off a little bit of, of what Sue discussed. And then lastly, um, I, I want to take a quick look, kind of an overview of, of what rules and, and what um, uh, basins and watershed follow which requirements, uh, kind of a, an overview kind of to you. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and start off uh, with, uh, here is my reminder, my disclaimer that anything that you hear talked about today in these presentations, the information backing that up, the rule sets and the application forms, the guidance documents are all available on our website. I recognize that I think I saw uh, uh, Nikki Mayer just put this in the chat in, in the previous presentation and just want to just reemphasize that if you have questions, there's information where you're confused or where to find uh, a, a, an application form, uh, this is the place to go. The DWR's right here in Buffer Protection Program webpage. Please bookmark this page. Um, use it. Um, let us know if you have questions for it. It's um, where um, the uh, this outreach um, workshop material will be hosted in a future date. And so just want to emphasize that um, if you have questions or if you need information, um, go here to, to find your answers. And if you can't find them there, please do uh, reach out and, and let us know. Now, I, I want to start here uh, with this flow chart uh, on applying for a buffer authorization from DWR. You know, I recognize that, um, you know, there's continuing education credits offered for this. I think there's some requirement that unless there is a complicated flow chart on how to review buffer authorizations, that continuing education credit just isn't valid. So I felt obliged to fill that gap and provide uh, a flow chart here. But joking aside, you know, I, I hope this can be helpful for, for consultants who are applying for buffer authorizations and also for local governments uh, who are reviewing buffer authorizations. Um, I've had a number of projects myself where um, I've looked at these projects and reviewed these applications, and um, sometimes uh, these things can be stopped before they start. In other words, sometimes applications are submitted incorrectly or in areas that are not buffered. And so if we step through this flowchart here briefly, uh, I hope this will be helpful in, in kind of uh, what to consider and what to review um, uh, when you're looking at these applications or, or how to apply. And so if we start up here, I'm going to use my red laser pointer here to outline where I am in the chart. We start here. The first question we need to ask is, is the project in a buffer basin? As Sue showed on, on her presentation, there are a number of watersheds in North Carolina uh, to which the riparian buffer protection rules don't apply. And so from a state perspective, from the state rule set or the delegated government's rule set, 
the, those don't apply. They're not active in those watersheds. Bear in mind that if we say, no, it's not the buffer basin, always check your local requirements. As Sue pointed out, there are other programs, such as a water supply watershed um, that use uh, the term buffers interchangeably with the term setbacks. And so therefore, um, there may be a local quote buffer that applies to the project that is outside of the state rules. And so just be aware of that. Once we conclude that, yes, we're actually in a buffer basin, um, make sure we check the authority for it. Uh, the, the designated and delegated authorities sometimes are different between uh, municipal uh, governments. Um, in other words, sometimes a county has the authority in places. Other time, if it's a town or cities, uh, ETJ, they have the jurisdiction. And then sometimes those differ. There are some cities that you know, are um, state jurisdiction and the rest of the county is, is local jurisdiction or vice versa. So remember to check and see uh, it, it, see what who has the authority in the area uh, in which you're working. Once you determine uh, it is state authority, you're in an area where DWR does implement and, and do the riparian buffer rules. Um, the next question, and this seems like a basic question, but the next question to ask is, are subject water features present? And so this is where things like a stream determination or a, uh, a, a buffer determination, uh, it comes into play. So someone who is certified by the state or, or by the local or works with the local authority and is certified to make applicability calls um, need to be the one to determine if subject feature waters are present. This is where the uh, USGS uh, topography maps come into play, the NRCS soil survey maps, and the field work comes into play. And so um, I'm not going to get too much into that, but just to make sure that the, there are subject waters, uh, fe subject water features that are present. Um, in other words, just because there is a stream on the ground does not necessarily mean it is subject to the buffer rules. Um, it needs to be investigated. It likely would be, but it's not always the case. So once we're in a scenario where, yes, we're in a buffer basin, we've determined it's DDR state authority, there are subject water features present, then the first thing we do is go pull up that subject set of rules and check the categories, uh, check the table of use category for the project. This is things like, is it a greenway? Is it a road crossing? Is it a utility crossing? Is it a playground? And we look in the table of, uh, table of uses specific to that category to find out what allowance they have. And what I mean by allowances is which group are they in in the category? Uh, or which category are they in for, for that table of use item? Is it deemed allowable? And we, again, we have um, with the new rules, of a, save for the Jordan exception, the Jordan rules stayed the same with the three categories, which I'll touch on a little bit more in a minute. But with the new rules, we have four categories. We have deemed allowable, we have allowable upon authorization, allowable with mitigation upon authorization, and prohibited. And so starting at deemed allowable, if you are deemed allowable, you do not need an authorization certificate from DWR to conduct the activity. Um, you, you can move forward with the activity provided that you implement the best management practices and the project is uh, reduced and avoided and minimized to the maximum extent practical. And so those, those, those requirements still apply uh, to the project in deemed allowable projects, uh, even if there is not um, a delegated or, or state authority uh, who are reviewing the project. Um, next is, is allowable upon authorization, allowable upon authorization with, uh, or allowable with mitigation, excuse me, upon authorization. So these are our, our two categories that we'll focus on in more detail again in this presentation. But these two categories basically mean that the authority has to review. You have got to submit something to the authority, whether it's the state or the local, and they have to review the project can issue an authorization certificate, issue you a piece of paper before the project can, um, can take place. And so in these scenarios where we're submitting, it's, it's the time to also ask the question, does the project require a 401 certification? And basically this means that a 401 certification is something issued by the state for any federally permitted or licensed activity that would result in a discharge of dredge or fill material to the surface water. So if you're putting things actually in the stream that would disturb the better bank or putting in fill and that are replacing a culvert in the stream, those are activities that would trigger a 401 certification. So if your project is one that does trigger a 401 certification and requires a buffer authorization, 
we can use a pre-construction notification form to, to submit for, for authorization. Um, that form's done online and it has a complete buffer section to capture all the buffer info. If your project does not require a 401 certification, in other words, the activity ju is just in the riparian buffers of the stream, but not in the stream itself, uh, then we have a separate form. It's just a straight buffer authorization application form. Um, be sure to include your mitigation if that's a part of it, but make sure we're using the right form and it'll help these projects be processed quickly and expeditiously from DWR. Lastly, if you are, uh, two more categories, if you are not, or if you're prohibited, let's start with prohibited. If you're prohibited from the table of use, um, there's only one way to uh, get authorization for that type of activity, and that is through the variance process. Um, and I'll touch on that in detail in a minute, but basically that's uh, a, a, a challenging process to go through in terms of, of, of time, and it has to be presented to the EMC uh, in most cases. And again, we'll go into that a little bit more, but these are for extenuating rare circumstances that um, there's no other way to complete this project without somehow impacting the riparian buffer, and it has to be granted pursuant, through a, pursuant to a variant. If it's not explicitly prohibited in the table of uses, but it's just not in there, if we're just not in the table of uses, meaning the project contemplates an activity that's not outlined in there, um, you could get authorization through allowable with exception um, per O2B 0611. That's the new rule set that sets up this allowable with exception framework. And I'll go over that a little bit more detail in just a minute. So these allowable with exception and variance applications always include a mitigation proposal and are required uh, component uh, as part of this. Again, I'm going to uh, conclude this slide with a disclaimer that the Jordan rules look different for the categories, the, the table of use categories. And again, there's no exception process in the Jordan rules. It's just the variant process um, uh, that was established uh, before the rule change in June uh, of 2020. So that being said, this is an example of what the table of use categories look like in the new rules. Um, again, we have our deemed allowable, allowable upon authorization, allowable with mitigation upon authorization and prohibited. And really the point here is this is how to use the table of uses. We look down the left-hand column to decide where we are or what activity we're doing in the buffer. If the activity is construction of playground equipment or, or ponds uh, by impounding streams protection of existing structures. So these are kind of, and as Sue pointed out, it's important to read the whole table of uses just because we wanna be sure that um, we have the right naming convention. In other words, playground equipment is under P for playground equipment instead of R, recreational equipment or, or some other type of category. So um, be sure, just familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with the appropriate table of uses for your area. And also remember that within each item in the table of uses, there could be different use categories based on how the item is, is applied. And, and this is in detail here for this playground equipment item. For example, if you're installing playground equipment on a single family lot that does not involve the removal of vegetation, you are deemed allowable, you can move forward. However, if you have to remove vegetation to install it in the buffer, that requires an authority's review uh, and approval. And so just be very careful as you're looking and reading this table of uses. This provides a lot of answers to questions um, that, that we get. And so uh, read, read this table carefully and be familiar with it for, for your area of the right here in buffer rules. Um, in these categories specifically, uh, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this because again, Sue did touch on this, but uh, deemed allowable means uh, it's what the old category of exempt was. Uh, but deemed allowable, still, you still must use best management practices to minimize disturbance for those type of activities, even though you don't have to get a written approval from the authority. Secondly, on allowable upon authorization, uh, you may proceed with the activity, but you've got to get that written authorization from DWR or the local authority. Um, the mitigation is the same as allowable upon authorization, except these necessarily require a mitigation proponent and component, and a mitigation piece has got to be included in the application. Uh, rule 15A NCAC 02B uh, 0295 is what outlines the mitigation requirements for each specific watershed. Um, allowable with exception, these are again are for activities that are not specifically listed in the table of uses, 
This is not a, an explicit table of use category, I'll add, but this is our, again, for activities that are just not uh, listed in the table of uses, they do require a hardship demonstration. Lastly, prohibited items cannot prohibit or cannot proceed for this category unless their variance is, unless a variance is granted. So really what I wanna focus on is, is these three types of activities first off, because these are the three activities or these are the three categories of uses that do require some review and some written concurrence from the division or the, or the authority. So in submitting projects require, that require buffer authorization, this is just an example, a slide to show exactly how these forms are used. Again, we went back to this piece of the flow chart. If the project does require a 401 certification, the appropriate form to use is the, the PCN form, the pre-construction notification form. This is an example of what the paper form looks like. We also have an online form. And on that online form, there's a specific buffer section of that online form to, to put in all the buffer impacts and all the information about the buffer impacts. Um, if you do not have any direct stream or surface water impacts and you do not trigger a 401 review, we have the separate buffer authorization application form to be used. And that is also available in, in online form. So um, uh, just a couple notes here, please be sure if you're applying to, to uh, submit complete applications, um, there's no fee as from DWR for the review and issuance of buffer authorizations. Um, the 401 certifications and, and joint 401 buffer projects do carry a fee. Uh, those fees are governed by the 401 rules and, and the 401 certifications. And so um, again, the, the riparian buffer piece is just tacked onto that. Um, there's no additional fee, in other words, for the riparian buffer. And so uh, when we submit an application, this is really what we want to look for. If, you're, if DWR is reviewing this, this is what we're looking for in complete applications. This is what um, local governments should be looking for in complete applications. And again, this is codified in our new administration portion of the rule. That's an O2B0611, uh, specifically subsection B1. Um, but first thing, you know, the applications have to have contact and legal information. This includes things like property deed information, agent authorization forms. Um, the application has to include uh, a description of the nature activity, the nature of the activity that they're conducting, uh, including uh, um, why the impacts cannot be avoided, including a description of avoidance and minimization um, application uh, to the activity. Um, the application also has to tell us exactly where it is, the location of the activity, the location of the subject water body, um, the uh, stream information, the, the surface water classification for the sub subject water body, um, et cetera. Um, map and detail sheets to support, supporting exhibits to support the application, showing where the riparian buffer uh, impacts are, are, are taking place. They uh, have to show the, the dimensions of any disturbance um, and the extent of the riparian buffers that are actually on the property. They need to accurately and legibly represent that uh, to conduct a proper review. And as I mentioned before, it needs to include a detailed avoidance and minimization discussion and an explanation why the project can't be reduced or reconfigured to better minimize disturbance to the riparian buffer and protect water quality. Um, the application also has to include any plans for best management practices to control sedimentation runoff or nutrification of the stream while the activity is, is being conducted or constructed. And then um, if applicable, it also has to include a, a, mit a mitigation proposal in compliance with rule uh, 02B0295, if that's applicable, if you're in that table of use category, or if you're in a variance or um, exception uh, framework. And again, this is just that rule citation where all the details of what's included in the mitigation proposal uh, live, so to speak, 02B0295. And so once we have complete applications um, and we begin to review them, this is really our main focus, the meat and potatoes of what we wanna review when we're looking at um, applications. Uh, the, the rule procedures, again, for the state rules are set out in O2B0611. That you know, has actual specific procedures that I'm gonna go over here. So that's the rule reference here. Um, in the application, the applicant shall demonstrate uh, three major things, one, uh, that the basic project can't be accomplished, practically accomplished, in a manner that would better minimize disturbance, preserve aquatic life, and protect water quality. Two, 
the applicant or the use can't practically be reduced in size or density or reconfigured to better minimize disturbance um, and protect water quality. And then three, best management practices uh, are used and in place to minimize this disturbance and protect water quality. And generally, um, or, or DWR and local governments are, are charged with reviewing the applications to ensure that these three meat and potato components of the rule uh, are met. And really, um, the way to summarize, excuse me, the way to summarize these, these three components are, are the first component uh, is the avoidance component. In other words, can we get the project done by avoiding impacts? The, the project cannot practically be accomplished in another manner um, that would avoid it, that would minimize disturbance. Uh, two is the minimization criteria. This is once we know we cannot avoid riparian buffer impacts, how we minimize those impacts to the maximum extent practical. And three is known as the just the best management condition. Now that we can avoid and we've minimized the maximum extent practical, um, are we implementing best management practices to control um, the, the activity, particularly during construction, but also uh, through the project lifetime? Um, so how long do we have to do this? So again, in 0611, the rule sets out we have 60 days. DWR and local government has 60 days to review the applications and take action. And, and those actions that are available to the authorities to, to take are, are three actions. One, we can issue an authorization in writing. So we can send back the piece of paper granting an authorization certificate. Two, we can notify the applicant and that we need more information and we can request more information. Or three, we can deny the request. And so uh, the, the operative point here, though, is that failure to take any one of these three actions within 60 days is considered an issuance of the authorization certificate. And so if we don't act, we are silent in 60 days, that is considered an issuance of authorization and the activity can proceed. And the rule does have a few caveats unless one of the following occurs. Um, the applicant has agreed to a longer time period. The applicant can't furnish or fails to furnish requested information. Um, the applicant refuses to provide access to the site or records that are necessary to complete the review or that information uh, is otherwise um, unavailable. Now, um, specifically, this is more, now that we know kind of how to review the application, I wanted to just touch on a little bit more kind of actual practical um, uh, review of, of buffer authorizations out and this is not a comprehensive list, but these are some of the things that we work on looking for uh, when we're looking at buffer authorization applications. First of all, are all the streams showing? Is it a complete picture of what's happening on the site? Uh, the suggestion is to compare these uh, to the USGS and soil survey maps to make sure that those streams are showing so there are not impacts that are, not, um, that are unintentionally not shown on the application. Two are the streams um, where we expect them in the topography. Are they straight lines? Are, are you know we don't expect streams to be straight lines unless they're modified. Um, and so therefore, do they show their natural sinuosity as expected? Um, do impacts for crossings occur at straight segments of streams as a as a minimization technique? Um, are there provisions to ensure that stormwater meets the rule criteria? In other words, is stormwater in that dispersed flow? Is the project designed to convert that stormwater? into that dispersed flow or otherwise comply with the rule uh, as far as stormwater management and stormwater management outlets. And then lastly, are all the buffer um, uh, impacts uh, accounted for? And this is, you know, when we're looking at subdivision, for example, does it include all the utility impacts and the sediment erosion control uh, measures on the plan? So we don't, so we know that those are gonna be proposed at a later time in the right period buffer. Um, does it include temporary impacts? There are temporary impacts associated with construction often. And then does it have allowances for your stormwater management outlets? And lastly, of course, uh, mitigation uh, as applicable um, if the rule requires that, a mitigation proposal. Uh, here's a quick example um, of a buffer exhibit and kind of what we're looking at. This is an, this is an example of an exhibit that I would uh, deem some things are lacking here. I would ask for more information on the exhibit. Um, the first thing that jumps out to me is this is the stream segment here in the middle of the paper, in the middle of this exhibit, the stream segment occurs in a fairly straight line. I have a question about, um, is this the, the actual uh, natural stream um, placement in the topography or is this, has this been modified? So I'd ask questions about that. The second thing I see here is the riparian buffer. We're in the noose as this plan shows. It doesn't show zone one and zone two. It only shows 
the broad 50 foot wide pier and buffer, but we don't have the zone impacts. Uh, three, it doesn't show any kind of uh, impacts for this road crossing here. I think the intention here is to show that a road is crossing the riparian buffer, but as presented, I can't tell if there's a buffer that's just not applicable here or if this is an, an impacted area. There's no hashing or, or shading uh, to denote impacts there. Uh, another thing I'm seeing here is, is I'm wondering about the stormwater management plan. It looks really incomplete in that I see just one stormwater outlet that looks like a a curb and gutter outlet here. I'm wondering about the other stormwater management plan and where the other stormwater ponds possibly would discharge. And then lastly, um, there's lots that look like they will maintain protected riparian buffers. And so that's something that we wanna be aware of and be sure that those lots include deed notes on them to show that these lots are applicable to riparian buffers. We prefer that lots are not platted within the riparian buffer for that reason. Um, but if they are shown, we wanna ask for more information to ensure that that's covered. Um, here's an example of a, of a much better uh, exhibit in a, in a buffer authorization. So this exhibit actually, first of all, shows that the stream is sinuous. This is the stream segment here pro as proposed. This project is also for one project in that it's proposed a culvert along the stream that's in that uh, checkered straight line here. But I can tell that this stream, first of all, is sinuous and the riparian buffer follows along, along that sinuosity of the stream. It follows the contour of that stream. Um, I can also tell that uh, we're in the Jordan and it has zone one and zone two clearly, deline uh, clearly marked and delineated on the map. Um, it also shows uh, the impacts as uh, I, I know just from looking at the table of this map that uh, T zone two means a temporary impact in zone two. There are temporary impacts represented by that hashing. This is a temporary impact of zone one represented by that hashing. And the rest of these, these are permanent impacts. This hashing represents permanent impacts of zone two and this kind of stars are, are permanent impacts to zone one. And so I have a much clearer picture exactly where the permanent and temporary impacts are. Um, in addition, um, I, have a, I have a better representation of exactly what activity is occurring on the site so I can complete my avoidance minimization review. Once we've completed that review, um, we issue an authorization in writing. And just to touch on that real briefly, um, once we're satisfied with the avoidance, the um, purpose, the avoidance and minimization, and the best management practices, then we're ready to issue this authorization. Um, some good best practices uh, for authorities who are issuing this, uh, some that DWR carry forward, are one, we have to identify uh, the project number for a file and for reference. Um, two, we're, we clearly address it to the applicant or the um, applicant of the, for the buffer authorization and uh, make it clear for emailing that too. I know COVID, these times things often go out electronically and physically. And so we wanna make sure that we are uh, making it clear how we're communicating this authorization. Also, there's a note here that we should copy the property owner if the applicant is not the property owner. Make sure the property owner knows when there are legal determinations being made that, um, that affect their property. Um, and then the, another point here is in the subject, we're clearly telling what we're, what we're doing. We're giving an authorization certificate Per what rules. In this case, it's the news, O2B0714. And so uh, we make it clear exactly what we're authorizing there, um, whether it's an approval, uh, authorization, or a denial, or a request for more information. Um, it needs to be clearly stated in, the, in this subject or up front. Um, lastly, there's a project name so we can identify uh, in another level outside of just the uh, DWR or just the ID number and then an expiration date uh, for, for the letter. And so once we have, that's kind of the, the basic information that should be in every letter. And then we have the authority to add conditions to that letter if we determine appropriate. And so as far as the conditions go, well, first off, let me say there should be a buffer impact table that clearly outlines specifically what impacts we're authorizing and specifically what we're not. In other words, this, author, this authorization is for zone one impacts only, there are no zone two impacts. And the first impact called B1 uh, allows for 150 feet of permanent impact and, and no temporary impact. Uh, the second impact of B2 uh, allows for uh, no permanent impact and some temporary impact. So again, best practices are to include the zeros in this impact table to make sure it's, it's specifically clear whether the authority is authorizing or not authorizing any impact. And then in addition, we can include whatever conditions are necessary to, um, to implement the rules and ensure 
that the intent of the buffer protection program uh, are preserved. And this includes things like BMPs, mitigation requirements, and restoration of temporary disturbed areas. Um, once the authorization is issued, there is an appeal process for the state um, that's 60 days. The appeal must be filed within 60 days to the Office of Administrative Hearings. Um, appeals of local government uh, projects uh, go, uh, go through uh, their process and then go to the director of DWR. Uh, DWR director's decision is appealable also by uh, per appeal to OAH, Office of Administrative Hearings. And again, that must be filed within 60 days. These are outlined in chapter, 100, chapter 150B of, of North Carolina um, general statutes and, and it's title 26 of North Carolina Administrative Code. That's where the authority for the appeals procedure uh, lies. Um, la lastly here, or towards the end here, I wanna just touch on the uh, um, allowable with exception category. And so Sue went over this, but I just wanna hit a few highlights here in that, um, look, if these are for activities per the new rules that are not listed in the table of uses, they're meant for really unique and rare situations where there are no reasonable, other reasonable options. Um, these must meet specific hardships. Uh, so the criteria are more stringent um, than regular buffer authorizations. And again, as Sue pointed out, um, it's the major exception is for impacts that occur with um, a third of an acre of impacts or greater in any of the zones. So just a third of any of the 50 foot zones and one or zone two, a third of an acre collectively, um, they require a major exception and a 30 day public notice. And then if you're less than a third of an acre and you're not in the table of uses, that requires a, a minor exception. And both of these have mitigation uh, components as, as part of them. And again, they are reviewed and approved by the authority, whether it's DWR or it's the local government. So follow the, your local ordinances. If you're in a designated or delegated, their ordinance may not be updated. And so they take primacy if they're the delegated program to follow those local ordinances. And then again, just to note, remember uh, in specifically in the Jordan watershed, those rules um, have not been updated. So they include the old variance process. That means a major variance is in any impact in zone one that's prohibited or outside of the table the minor variances in the, any impact in zone two that's prohibited or outside of the table of uses. And those, uh, again, still require approval by uh, the EMC. However, the criteria for those are exactly the same. Um, yeah, there's the call out to remember that the Jordan process is still uh, a, a little bit different, still in the quote old, uh, those rules were relatively new, were not updated in June of 2020. But however, irrespective of whether it's the variance or the exception process, the findings of fact and the criteria apply are exactly the same. Um, we have to check all these boxes and that first, that there are hardships that prevent compliance with the rule. And what hardships mean is that the applicant can, can secure no reasonable return from or make reasonable use of the property without this buffer impact. And the rule specific that it says, a greater profit is not considered adequate justification. The rule also mandates that whatever impacts that have to occur are a minimal deviation from the rule. They also require that the hardship is due to the physical nature of the property, uh, that is the topography. Um, the applicant did not cause the hardship by knowingly violating the rule and asking for an exception. And that the authorization would be consistent uh, with the general spirit and purpose and intent of the buffer rules. And so we have to review these things. The authority or DWR has to review these things to check all these boxes to determine if the hardship is present to be able to issue uh, an exception. Okay. Um, lastly, on variances, again, these are for prohibited activities, um, activities that are specifically listed in the rule that are prohibited. Here again is, is the note about uh, the Jordan rules that were not updated. So make, make sure you follow whatever rule procedures are in place for your, uh, for your watershed. Um, Jordan again includes uh, the old process that includes major and minor variances and the major variances still go up to the EMC for, for review, um, which is uh, you know, a little bit different uh, than the exception process that's availed to some of the new rule sets. But however, in the new rule sets, if the activity is explicitly prohibited, it only can be authorized by variance for, for the EMC. Um, it it uh, is pursuant to rule 02B0226, 
And it really what it mirrors is a water quality standard variance. So it requires agency approval, um, even possibly a public hearing for the variance. And so it's a much, it's a very stringent procedure to go through that. But just wanted to kind of outline that if the item is prohibited in the table of uses, there still is a process to apply for and request a variance for that. So that's, that's kind of how to review, that's the variance and exception process. And I'll conclude here just with a really quick overview of a comparison table that um, uh, we'll provide as part of this presentation for folks to use. Really what this shows is the different riparian buffer watersheds or the different watersheds that have state buffer rules. And it's just a quick reference chart to look at what the purpose of these rules are, who's implementing these, um, what they apply to. Uh, and then the last items are actually where the zones are, what the mitigation requirement is. And so, for example, we can tell the purpose of the Goose Creek watershed riparian buffer rules are to protect the Carolina hill splitter, uh, threatened endangered species. Um, you know, for example, if you go to implementation, we know in the random watershed, all the local governments uh, implement the rules except for specific activities that are exceptions. And then, um, you know, for example, applicability. We can look and say the Catawba, uh, you know, the rules only apply to the main stem uh, rivers. Uh, below Lake James uh, in, in that basin. So we can tell uh, exactly where the rules apply. So that's just an example of how to use this chart. And the chart's actually continued um, on this page to give a quick reference to where zone and where zone one and two are in the various watersheds. And then also what mitigation requirements apply to each of the zones. Again, this mitigation requirement, if you don't wanna dig into the 0295 rule, 02B0295 rule, this is a handy reference chart to kind of show those mitigation ratios. Uh, if you have a project that is in the table of use categories that triggers a mitigation requirement or it's a variance or exception that does trigger a mitigation requirement. So um, that's a, a, a deeper dive down into it. That's a quick overview or, or lengthy overview possibly, um, but happy to answer any kind of questions when the time's right here. We're now going to hear from Patrick Beggs presenting on nutrient management strategies. Patrick's, Patrick is a planner for the non-point source planning branch in the Division of Water Resources. He is responsible for developing and implementing nutrient strategies to help stakeholders meet North Carolina water resource needs. Patrick comes to the division by way of North Carolina Cooperative Extension, where he designed public outreach and local watershed plans. I am Patrick Beggs with the Division of Water Resources. And I want to um, tell you about nutrient management strategies. So North Carolina has a set of watershed specific nutrient management strategies and buffers are a part of these strategies. So I wanna give you an overview of where we have nutrient management strategies, explain a little bit about what they entail, share which of them include buffers because they don't all. And in addition, a survey this past year identified a couple items that I can uh, clarify for you at the end of the year, at the end of the um, presentation. So first, why do we have nutrient management strategies? The earliest ones go back to the 80s, the, the uh, impacts of excess nutrients on our waters required us to develop them. The impacts of excess nutrients include uh, fish kills, overproduction of algae, and generally reduced ecosystem benefits downstream, whether that is in a lake, in a river, or in the estuary, excuse me, in the estuaries. So problems in the estuaries is what initially prompted nutrient management strategies. Another problem related to algae production is the impact on drinking water and the need for water treatment plants to remove it. And um, it can produce toxins that are harmful to breathing and also affect fishing and swimming and, and just general bodily contact, including for pets. Uh, so all of these impacts affect environmental, social, and economic components for North Carolina. So I mentioned these strategies are, are watershed specific, right? That might be an entire river basin like the Noose or Tar Pamlico. It might be just a specific smaller river like the New River in the White Oak River Basin, um, or the watershed of a lake, which is the rest of these here, Falls, Jordan, Randleman, and High Rock. 
but I wanna specifically point out that High Rock Lake does not yet have a nutrient management strategy, but we are planning for one. And that's in the um, Yadkin PD. And so earlier, Sue mentioned that we don't have a buffer program in the Yadkin PD, but it may come into play with, with the High Rock future management strategy. So the goal of the strategies is to control nutrients at their sources. And this is authorized from the Clean Water Act and by state statutes. So trying to remove nutrients once they reach their destination is largely ineffective and contrary to these laws. So an example of this is the Jordan Lake solar bees from a few years ago, if you remember them, they didn't work and they actually go against these, these laws. So one more thing to note about this map. I mentioned that buffers can be a part of these strategies, but buffers can be present without these strategies. So Goose Creek and Catawba River, the map that you saw earlier, are examples of buffer programs that do not have a nutrient management strategy or are not a part of it either. Uh, so they're not on this map. The reverse is also true. The Choan and the New River, which are, our, which are our earliest strategies, they don't have buffer rules. Um, okay, so potential elements of nutrient management strategies include wastewater permits. Uh, so basically point sources and non-point sources. So point sources are wastewater permits. Non-point sources are agricultural runoff strategies, riparian buffer strategies, stormwater management, runoff including new development and existing development. So new development is from changes in land use and runoff due to development, of course. Existing development is concerned with that stormwater that we just never really dealt with in the past, uh, but it's there. And then offsets and trading, this is a part of the strategy which allows um, allows an option of doing work in a different area of the watershed where it is easier, more cost effective to implement, and sometimes the only place that it's available to do anything uh, given the development that's occurring. So all of these strategies are meant to be, to change over time. And there's this great quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson that I see as a description of adaptive management. The quote is, the voyage of the best ship is a zigzag line of a hundred tacks. We see the line from a sufficient distance and it straightens itself out to the average tendency. So that's what I think the best science and the best decision-making and the best management, adaptive management can do is set its sights on something and then continue to fix it as we move along, as we get more information. All right, so I'll just go through these uh, strategies. The Choan and the New, in these, there's no buffer rules. Like I said, these, these were early. These, were in, these started in, um, in the 80s. Uh, they don't have all the elements that I mentioned. They don't have non-point source rules. Sometimes we, try to figure out if we can seek voluntary measures for this. Um, data collection continues. There, we're still struggling with excess algal, algal production again now, especially in the Choan. Uh, the Choan, you'll notice, goes way up into Virginia. And we do work with the Abermarl, the Abermarl Pamlico National Estuary Program works in concert with Virginia to do a lot of work since all that water comes to us. Both of these really need revisiting and adaptation. The Tar Pamlico and the Noose, these were readopted in the spring of 2020. And the buffer rules for these were readopted earlier. The Falls Lake watershed has its own nutrient management strategy that's separate from the noose um, nutrient management strategy. 
but it doesn't have its own buffer rule. So everything in the falls falls within the new buffer rules. Uh, the Falls Lake rules are scheduled to begin readoption in 2024. And right now they're undergoing a, a three-year study, uh, a lot of other work, but specifically a three-year study with the North Carolina Policy Collaboratory leading that. That came about from legislation a few years ago. Jordan uh, has a nutrient management strategy. It includes buffer rules. Uh, you heard a few times saying that the Jordan buffer rules have yet to be readopted with the others. That's because legislation uh, put them to be readopted with the rest of the Jordan nutrient strategy rules that began this year, last year, 2020. Um, the nutrient, the uh, North Carolina Policy Collaboratory did a three year study, some other studies going on, modeling that started with that study is continuing and will go through all of this year. So of all of the Jordan nutrient management rules, basically the, the ones that were delayed were the stormwater rules, the new development and the existing development stormwater rules. All the others are still in effect, wastewater, agriculture, buffers. Randallman Lake watershed, has a nutrient management strategy, which includes buffers. And its rule readoption became effective uh, in June, 2020. And like Jordan, the buffer rules are implemented by local governments. High Rock Lake watershed is planned to receive a nutrient management strategy. It's had a lot of studies performed in anticipation of a strategy. The modeling has been done. Um, both watershed nutrient delivery and lake nutrient response modeling has been, has been completed. The next step is nutrient criteria rulemaking. And we have an initial rule drafted and expected to go to the EMC, the Environmental Management Commission this spring. That will allow a nutrient management strategy rulemaking to start once we have that nutrient criteria rulemaking in place. Um, and of course that will take easily another, another two to three years. We're not really sure yet if it will include buffers. I would expect it to. Okay. So there was a survey um, sometime in the past year that maybe went out to, to a bunch of folks, to, to you. And one of the issues mentioned by respondents was the confusion between NSW, nutrient sensitive waters, and NMS, nutrient management strategies. It's because it's government, we just have tons of acronyms. Well, everybody does. So a nutrient management strategy is a program approved by the EMC, the Environmental Management Commission, to help alleviate excess nutrient inputs. NSW, nutrient sensitive waters, is a surface water classification. And the definition is here, supplemental surface water classification intended for waters needing additional nutrient management due to their being subject to excessive growth or microscopic or macroscopic vegetation. The NSW classification is not required to develop a nutrient management strategy. Randleman doesn't have an NSW classification. Um, High Rock Lake is, doesn't have a nutrient sensitive waters NSW classification either. Basically, the NSW classification is viewed as an un, a, a previously listed unnecessary procedural step because the EMC has since been given explicit legislative authority to develop restoration strategies to address impaired waters. Long story short, you just don't have to worry about the phrase NSW. And that, that's pretty much it. And the other, the other item that came up in a survey, people asked about the SNAP tool. So the SNAP, the Stormwater Nutrient and Phosphorus Tool, 
This is a project scale tool for estimating nitrogen and phosphorus in stormwater runoff from a, from a development site. And the nutrient reductions provided by a specific stormwater treatment. So the SNAP tool only applies to new development and existing development stormwater rules. And it's, it's not used for uh, nutrient accounting with, with buffers at all. Um, and in what you, when, in what you get from, from the webinar, I will have the uh, a link in there. Um, but if you search NC DWR SNAP tool, you'll get to the page with it if, if you want more information about it. So that's what I wanted to share about um, nutrient management strategies. That's all I got, Grace. We're now going to hear from Tom Giroux presenting on forestry practices and buffers. Tom is a water resources staff forester with the North Carolina Forest Service. He started with the Forest Service in 2002 and for that entire time has worked in the arena of non-point source pollution management, water quality BMPs, and most recently in the areas of policy, regulatory guidance, and compliance assistance tied to water quality, wetlands, and t and &E species. Prior to state service, he worked seven years in the forest industry across three states, overseeing timber harvesting operations and assisting with forest land management. Tom is a North Carolina registered forester, a certified erosion, sediment, and stormwater inspector, and holds a Bachelor of Science in Forest Management from North Carolina State University. Okay, thanks, Grace. I've got my title slide brought up on the screen. And I appreciate y'all being here and, and, uh, for the buffer rule session. Uh, real brief breeze through. Uh, next slide here, my forestry and buffer rules 101 and the role of the North Carolina Forest Service. Uh, the good news, as I think Sue pointed out earlier, forestry, when it comes to the buffer rules, is handled at the state level. So for those of you in local government, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> it's one less thing off your plate. Uh, but we wanted to, to kind of briefly highlight it just so you have a, the full complement of under, understanding all aspects of the buffer rules. Uh, DWR administers the buffer rules uh, when it comes to the state level for forestry. We as the Forest Service are a partner in arms. We kind of walk arm, arm in arm with them. Um, kind of the, the, the step one, again, handle the state. Step two, it's not delegated down. Step three, if you see a logging job in your county, uh, you're not too sure what's going on, talk to the county forest ranger. Uh, we have an office that serves every county of the state. Uh, it's available through our website that contact us uh, some of our counties, are, a few of our counties are combined, but otherwise we have a county, at least one county ranger. Most of our counties have an assistant ranger that serve every county in North Carolina. And it's their job to know what's going on in their county, as, as simple as that sounds. Um, it's their job to know what's going on in terms of forestry, forest harvesting, forest planting, prescribed burning, uh, timber that's being to be proposed for sale. And they do that through establishing their local networks. Uh, our role as the North Carolina Forest Service when it comes to water quality in the big picture, it's the education and prevention and consultation before regulation. There are some rules that we inspect for compliance, the FPG rules I'll touch on at the back end. We do a lot of BMP monitoring and technical assistance, training, outreach, interagency collaboration, much like what we're doing today. So we have a pretty big role in, in, in looking at the water quality and rose and sediment control world when it comes to forestry practices in the state. We are the, the, the lead agency for that. We're not a regulatory agency. Um, we are a service oriented agency. We provide that technical assistance and that education. We do some monitoring and, and do some documentation, recording some monitoring of inspection compliance. Uh, we don't enforce those rules. If there's an enforcement action needed, we will bring in the appropriate state enforcement agencies within DEQ to handle any potential enforcement actions. We are you know, quite literally the boots on the ground. Like I said, we've got offices in every county and one of our high priorities is to look at forestry operations as they're ongoing. Uh, there are a lot of rules, a lot of laws that related to water quality that govern forestry practices. Uh, the Sedimentation Pollution Control Act, which gives birth to the FPGs, 
There are some state laws prohibiting obstructions. We have the buffer rules. There are some federal, federal requirements for operating wetlands. And then we have our BMPs, our non-regulatory best management practices that are the tools in the toolbox as we characterize them. Uh, as we do logger training workshops and for, we train foresters, we say, okay, gang, here's what the rules require, the baseline standards. Now, how can you achieve compliance with those rules? Well, here's the BMPs. Here's the best management practices that you can pick and choose to apply on your sites as needed. And one comment also I'll make is that the forest industry has largely institutionalized the use of BMPs through the private sector. Uh, there are forest certification programs uh, where most all of the big paper companies, lumber companies, timber companies subscribe and participate in one of those programs. And they pledge to provide environmental sustainability goals uh, it's a private program. We don't run it through the state. You know, government doesn't run it. It's an industry supported programs uh, and they pledge to use BMPs in their states. So really the industry has kind of adopted the use of BMPs onto itself. Uh, and then we provide recurring monitoring, kind of give a snapshot of how we're seeing that BMP performance. Drilling down to the buffer rules. Uh, our role again is the North Carolina Forest Service we can do stream determinations uh, upon request from our customers on forestry sites. Uh, we don't do them on development sites or ag fields. You know, we're, it's gotta be a forestry site. Uh, it has to be a registered forester and they have to be certified through the SWITC process, the surface water identification and training certification process that is uh, run cooperatively from DWR and NC State. Um, when we're doing our routine forest water quality inspections, uh, we will observe the buffer rule zone area. And uh, if we observe what we think might be an apparent violation, we take some pictures, prepare some documents, and then we'll review that internally. And then we'll make that notification to Division of Water Resources, at which time DWR will then contact the parties, go out, make that compliance determination, and then if they need to do some follow-up actions, they'll take those follow-up actions. So we're a little bit, as one of our foresters likes to say, we're a little bit like the hall monitor. <laughs> um, you know, we're out there kind of observing what's going on with the buffer rules. We're providing that technical assistance. We're doing stream identifications. Uh, but if we do see something, we'll document it. And again, notify the proper authorities, in which case is Division of Water Resources. Um, forestry under the buffer rules, um, it's, you know, it's not considered a, in a prior existing use, technically. It's not, uh, but no prior approval is needed. Um, and no offsite, you know, offsetting mitigation is required. But there are forest harvest requirements in each of the buffer rules. And, uh, you know, they are very, very detailed as to uh, what practices are allowed, what is not allowed, what size of trees can be harvested, where within the buffer rule the trees can be harvested, uh, to harvest trees from zone one, the tract has some eligibility requirements associated with it. Um, there is some selective harvesting allowed. You know, this is what we'd like to see here, this photograph here, this is an, this is an example of a, of a forestry tract that has selective harvesting within the buffer rule zones. Minimizing disturbance to the ground cover. It was clearly marked with some paint so the logger knew, okay, here's, here's where we need to stop and, and take extra precautions. Uh, you see that flush of green growth come back up after a few trees were kind of plucked out to allow that landowner to re recoup some of their financial investment. Um, we've got a set of leaflets as our primary tool to communicate the buffer, uh, forest harvest requirements of the buffer rules. An example here, we've got them on our website. And this photo here just shows a, a, uh, the Noose River buffer rule that was implemented on a study site that we participated in up in, uh, up in uh, Durham County. Uh, Going back to the big picture again, um, we have these state rules called FPGs, uh, the Forest Practices Guidelines. They are part of the Sedimentation Pollution Control Act. They apply statewide. There are nine narrative performance standards. They apply in all forestry sites. Uh, we are the lead agency. We're doing you know, about three to 4,000 site inspections every year. And we're doing about another two to 3,000 follow-up reinspections every year on an annual basis. So we're seeing a lot of logging activities across the state. We do that annually. We're hitting again about three to 4,000 uh, across the state. 
Um, but again, enforcement remains vested with DEQ, or if we see a potential pesticide problem that goes through the Department of Agriculture. The, F, the thing about the FPGs are, um, there are several topics that are addressed through the FPGs. Uh, one of them is a requirement of a streamside management zone or SMZ, that's a term foresters use for stream buffer. Um, the FPGs were enacted in 1990. Uh, they've been around for a while. Um, we've in forestry, um, we've been doing stream buffers before stream buffers were cool. <laughs> uh, we just call them something different. They're called streamside management zones. Um, through our FPG rules, you know, timber harvesting is allowed, but there have to be erosion and control measures implemented. There has to be ground cover maintained. There has to be shade provided along perennial streams to prevent temperature fluctuations. Uh, there have to be obstructions that you can't allow to, you're not allowed to obstruct the stream flow. The stream banks have to be stable. Um, so like I said, we've got, a, we've got multiple sets of rules that apply to forestry. We have the FPGs, and then we have in certain places, these buffer rules. Uh, one does not take the place of another. Uh, both sets of rules have to apply um, if that stream is subject to that rule. And that's another key thing with our FPG rules, they apply to any intermittent stream in any perennial stream. Uh, whereas the buffer rules, you have to look them up on a map and then you have to determine on site, is it or is it not, you know, match up with what the map says. So um, just a real brief snapshot, you know, comparing one versus the other. Um, for those of you, again, local government, get to know your county forest ranger. Uh, they can assist you with any kind of questions that people come to you about forestry. For those of you maybe working in private sector as consultants, I would encourage you to work with your clients. Um, if they are you know, entitling land for development purposes, you know, I would encourage you to go through that proper entitlement process and not try to um, either intentionally or inadvertently circumvent you know, certain aspects of the entitlement process by claiming it's forestry one day, and then the next day saying, well, no, we're actually gonna develop it now. Um, that puts us as the Forest Service in a real difficult situation of trying to ascertain what's going on. So, you know, uh, just get to know the Forest, Serv uh, Forest Service folks in your county. We've got an abundance of information on our website. Through our water quality section, we have all of our leaflets and contacts in a section of frequently asked questions about logging, uh, how we do our inspection process. Our best management practices is also available on our website in uh, a quarterly newsletter. So that's a real brief breeze through, and I'll stay here through the question and answer period if uh, anybody has any questions. We'll now hear from Nikki Mayer regarding ordinance compliance and enforcement overview. Nikki has been with the North Carolina Division of Water Quality and Resources since 1998. Her career with DWR has included ambient monitoring coordination and macro benthos assessment in the water sciences section and compliance and enforcement in the central office in the 401 and buffer permitting branch. Her primary responsibilities currently include mitigation compliance oversight, website and database management, enforcement case development, technical assistance, program improvement, and SWITSE stream training class coordination. Nikki has a Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of North Texas, and prior to her career with DWR, worked for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers on a number of ecological and limnology research and monitoring projects in Texas and Oregon. Um, so I guess uh, what we'll talk about um, today uh, in the presentation is uh, buffer program authorities, ordinance review requirements, common issues, and violation examples to round it out. Um, so for delegated local governments or delegation uh, to local governments, um, as well as designation uh, to local governments of the buffer programs, um, the implementation of these rules would be um, uh, could be delegated or designated uh, according to our rules. And so uh, kind of like with everything else, we look to the rules uh, to, de to determine what we need to, to abide by. Um, so for delegations, um, the required information is listed in the rule. The local government would request a delegation from the EMC, um, Environmental Management Commission. Sorry, I'll try to get all my acronyms <laughs> included. Um, part of the request is, um, they need to, the local governments would need to document and demonstrate that they have the means and resources, um, financial and staff, um, as well as a legal framework to implement and enforce the program. Um, so um, 
Again, the program must ultimately um, comply with the rule and they must have a plan to address violations that include the remedy of the impacts and the restoration of buffers and their nutrient functions um, with provisions for deterrence against future, future violations. So that's all considered um, uh, essential to um, the information that's provided. Um, so the local government will request um, uh, this uh, delegation from the EMC. This request would be um, uh, made by the DWR staff with their recommendation for approval or denial or whatever, and the EMC would issue or deny the de delegation. Uh, similarly, designation um, can be uh, grant or designation goes to the local governments. Um, this is again uh, uh, provided for in the rule. Uh, for Randleman, the local governments implement the water implement the buffer programs within the water supply watersheds. For Jordan, it's in within the entire watershed, not restricted to water supply watersheds. So uh, in some situations, I think Paul's already uh, touched on some of this, um, the DWR still has uh, retains jurisdiction in certain areas or with certain activities. Um, for example, state and federal projects. Um, if, uh, if the multiple jurisdictions are included, you know, in the project, then uh, the state would oversee that. I kind of see that as kind of like the state highway system, or the, I'm sorry, the internet, interstate highway system, where you'd have multiple states with uh, oversight at the federal level. It's kind of similar to that. Um, also with local uh, government owned projects, um, we don't want people, we wouldn't want entities policing themselves. So again, the state would be responsible for that. Um, as Tom, you know, suggested, forestry and, and additionally agriculture, if those projects, those would be over, oversight, um, oversight would be by the state. And in areas beyond local program jurisdiction, uh, for example, outside the ETJ of um, a community within the county, the, the state would be um, overseeing that. So, uh, um, Buffer program ordinances. Um, the model ordinance examples we have on our website um, have, again, the rules have recently been updated, so they may be a little bit outdated in some aspects, but the structure and the format is still the same. Um, so if, if uh, local government is looking to update um, that using that as a, a resource is what we recommend. Um, the question comes to um, us is where the buffer ordinance you know, resides. Uh, the final answer, or the simple answer to that is it's up to local governments as long as the buffer rule requirements are met. Again, it goes back to the rules um, that first and foremost has to be addressed. Um, so it could be within the Unified Development um, Ordinance, the Stormwater or the Water Supply Ordinance, or as a separate buffer ordinance. And I think Sue also touched on that. So um, develop, development of the ordinance and updates. Um, so the updated ordinances must be submitted to DWR for approval. Um, again, we'll talk about the updated buffer rules would be a part of that. Um, as Sue had said, it's not, um, it's not required for the local governments to update now, but if they do, we, we um, suggest you submit your information to D DWR before you go for a local approval in case changes are needed. So in this case, before you go to your um, commissioners or council, um, the information would already have um, had some DWR review for, for technical aspects. And so we could present, um, in that situation, you could present a more complete um, draft to your, to your council. Uh, in addition, um, Demler Division of Energy, Mineral land, and Land Resources, um, if uh, may, they may me, need to be notified if uh, the ordinance uh, for buffers is within the stormwater or water supply ordinance because they are um, part of Demler. So DWR is required to conduct audits of the delegated and designated buffer programs. Um, some of the things we look for in this table, um, for example, the refer, repair and buffer administrator has to be designated um, and uh, as part of that, they, they need to be responsible for um, uh, obtaining the training that DWR, DWR puts on for um, uh, on-site determinations. Um, they'd have to coordinate the implementation and enforcement of the program and be, um, and also uh, this, I guess the same requirements would be for the trained staff. They'd have to be trained in um, 
on-site determinations, as well as um, implementing um, the, the compliance and enforcement aspects. Um, again, we look back to the, the buffer rule to determine that you know, the ordinance must meet the requirements of the rules. Uh, we'd also look in the um, audits, we'd look at records to verify that um, the proper maps are used were, um, again, zone one and zone two are according to the, the um, basin that um, um, the location, uh, if the proper rules are being um, followed. Um, we'd look at buffer determination letters um, as well as authoriz authorizations exceptions, variances, we look at all the records to um, ensure that we have um, the documents and the information that uh, we're passing on to um, the permittees um, is, is meeting the criteria of the rules. Um, complaints and inspections and how those are resolved will be looked at. Uh, we'd look at notice of violations and penalties that were issued, um, again, making sure that all the records are uh, maintained. Also, um, important part is to um, to um, see how the buffer requirements are incorporated in the development approval workflow so that um, we're not looking, we're looking to avoid the kind of the after the fact um, buffer issues. We'd rather have that um, look properly placed in the process so that um, we're avoiding um, problems. Uh, also, potentially, if, if they happen to um, apply, we have inter interlocal agreements we would talk about or education and outreach program efforts. And I don't know that in the past we did as many site inspections, but I think that's um, a greater focus as we move forward and doing audits in the future. All right, so we have um, the rest of the talk. We'll talk, uh, take a look at the following areas and highlighting some of the common issues. And we'll also look um, at some violation examples. So buffer determinations are, um, you must be certified in order to make an official legally binding determination. So that would include um, DWR staff, the local governments that are trained. Again, you're all trained on the, the surface water identification training certification class. Um, Forest Service would be um, who we look to for silviculture um, activities. So those are the, the three main um, categories of folks that are able to do these calls. Uh, they're also able to sign off if someone else has presented a call, they would have to um, determine whether that is, they, they would approve of that call or agree with it. Um, so as Sue, um, I think it's been explained a couple times, <laughs> we have to use the correct reference maps and those would be the um, USGS topo maps and the NRCS soil surveys. Uh, the most current or um, for soil survey would be the, um, um, not the web soil survey, the, the printed maps. Um, and the, the training method we use is now um, version 4.11 of the DWR method for identification of intermittent perennial streams. Um, and that class basically takes a three-tiered approach, looks at geomorphology, hydrology, and biology to determine um, the persistence of waters for buffer applicability. So for example, um, we would classify at the end of um, at the end of the training, you, you know how to classify a stream as ephemeral, which would not be applicable to the rules, um, intermittent or perennial, which would um, apply, uh, buffers would apply. So in making determinations uh, for any project, we would look at all the map features on the property. Um, again, you have to have, it has to be on the map to, to apply. And then you also want to, um, you want to verify in the field because if it's mapped, um, it's only it's, it's buffered if it is exists. <laughs> so um, you'd have to determine otherwise to kick it out. I guess is is the way it's, it's um, explained. In addition to these maps, um, uh, a recent aerial map is usually um, provided to explain the, the location of the project site where we've been. And Shelton's a big fan of taking photos. So that's an example of that. In the buffer determination letters, I think Paul's already covered this, but this is key information that we want to make sure is um, included. And again, we'll look at this and during the, the audit. Um, the determination only addresses applicabil applicability to the buffer rules and does not approve any activity within buffers or waters within the state. A determination letter is not an approval letter. There, there's no, no impacts are um, approved with this letter. Um, 
also want to note that there may be other streams or features located on the property that don't appear on the maps that we reference. And any of the features on the site um, that may be considered jurisdictional, uh, according to US Army Corps of Engineers, um, could be subject to the Clean Water Act, Section 404 and 401. Um, but again, we're not we're not addressing that because this is a determination letter. But it's just a heads up. Um, we also want to say that the determination expires within five years and offer landowners or affected parties um, an opportunity to appeal the ter determination, but that request must be made within 60 days and um, be made in writing to the director of D DWR. And that's our address there. Um, I think this has been covered too. <laughs> Again, we refer to the table of uses for categories and threshold requirements. Um, Jordan has the same categories as we've had up until now, and then we have, for the rest of them, we have new categories. So I think everybody ha has heard a couple of times what those are. I'll go ahead and go on to the next slide. Um, so written application may be needed. Uh, we review and issue it. Um, the authorization certificates are addressed in 0.0611 for the new uh, rules, and Jordan and would be in uh, 0267 for those authorizations. Um, and again, as Paul had, had um, said earlier, the um, review process includes purpose and need um, of the project, avoidance and minimization um, as, a, as a major consideration, um, and, and included with that would be an explanation of why this plan for the activity can't be practically accomplished, reduced, relocated, or reconfigured to avoid or better minimize disturbance to the riparian buffer. Um, again, we'd also look at uh, BMPs or SCMs. Um, SCMs are stormwater control measures. Um, and you'd look at uh, the use of those to minis minimize disturbance, again, to preserve aquatic uh, life and habitat and protect water quality. Um, and again, mitigation may also be a component, um, if applicable at that, at that project site. So if mitigation is triggered, uh, the 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 first thing we'd you know, request that you do is to be sure to refer to 0295, which is the Consolidated Buffer Mitigation Rule. Um, it, it addresses uh, mitigation ratios in regard to uh, the zones of the buffer rules, um, as well as uh, to locations. Um, it's the hydrologic area, in this case, that's designated by the HUCs, which are hydrologic unit codes. And again, if you have any questions about mitigation, please feel free to um, call DWR and, and we'll, we'll get you some whatever help you need. Uh, regarding dispersed or diffuse flow, uh, again, diffuse flow was used, and I think Sue has already covered this as well. Diffuse flow was in the Jordan language used in the Jordan um, in the past, and it's still in the Jordan rule now. Um, however, the, um, the new rules include um, a more prescriptive definition of dispersed flow. Uh, means uniform shallow flow that's conveyed to a vegetated filter strip, uh, another vegetated area, or stormwater control measure. And the purpose is to remove pollutants through infiltration and settling, as well as to reduce erosion prior to stormwater reaching surface waters. So it's very clear on what we expect to achieve with this. <laughs> Uh, SCMs can be used to meet dispersed flow requirements. They can also be used to reduce pollutants or uh, nutrient loading rates if required. Um, if nutrient reduction cannot be fully met, there is an option to purchase nutrient offset credit. Um, and again, that's uh, described in rule. Um, the one thing to note is that um, proof of purchase of those credits is uh, required um, to be um, provided to the local government prior to approval of the development plan. So that has to be set up in advance. So I'm gonna take a stab at some <laughs> photos that Shelton provided for um, uh, common site issues. Um, i start with the first top left. Um, the, this is a, I think it's a culvert next to a roadside. And to me, um, it seems like excessive clearing for a right of way. That's a pretty broad shoulder. Um, I would assume that that could be narrowed down so that you'd have fewer buffer impacts. Um, the one below that, <laughs> to me, looks backwards. Um, the buffer is completely removed, yet the scrub around the house that's being constructed is protected by a silt fence. Um, 
So I, that's completely backwards to me. <laughs> um, so this would be a, a, a buffer violations because it's a buffer violation because they've completely denuded zone one and probably part of zone two in that picture. Uh, the, uh, the two on the right um, are utility crossings and they can sometimes be problematic. Um, and uh, again, we'd have to look at the table of uses and verify but, you know, with each rule. Um, but the width of the corridor varies um, according to activity type. So these, there's, uh, you do have to consult the rules to kind of verify what's going on in these situations. And the one on the left, the aerial pipe, um, because the, um, we don't have vegetation on the banks, um, armoring is required, um, and that can be part of the permit process. Uh, in this situation, I assume this is where um, buffer and 401 regulations kind of meet. Um, because you have riprap uh, that needs to be maintained above the high water normal high water mark, and if it slumps in, it'll require maintenance, so you're not getting into other issues that I guess would be kind of tangent to the buffer requirements. Um, and then the gas pipeline in the picture on the right um, it appears appears to cross a stream with a wide corridor that's cleared and maintained. Um, I would assume that that corridor could be narrowed at the stream or should be narrowed at the stream crossing so that you'd minimize the buffer impacts. Um, but outside of the stream, it's 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 not an issue for us. Nikki, just a any... time warning, just a few more minutes. Sure, okay. So um, three more, you can, uh, <laughs> I think these are a little bit more obvious. Zone two is um, uh, to be maintained in vegetation. And in this case, we've got a sidewalk. Um, the other two buffer or violations appear. There's no buffer. Um, there's been no consideration. There's been um, heavy equipment going through the stream and the buffer. So I think those are pretty obvious violations. Um, really quickly, um, lots buffered within lot boundaries. Um, uh, when buffer requirements are included within a lot, cities and counties shall require that the buff repair and buffer area be shown on the recorded plat. If it's not platted, the potential for non-compliance within the buffer rules is an issue. So in this situation, we we highly recommend uh, having um, lots and, um, I'm sorry, lots exclude buffers and streams, um, kind of have developments um, consider common areas for those instead. And the last thing, um, conversion to resident, residential, Tom kind of alluded to this as well. Uh, once you've changed the use, uh, you get uh, if you're claiming an agricultural exemption. Once the chain, you change the use from agricultural to anything else, that exen exemption ceases. So, uh, once you get to a residential um, plan of development, um, that needs to include buffers because that uh, exemption no longer holds. And I think that's it. Any questions? Now we did have a live training that covered all of this material that you are learning today. And within that training, we went into breakout groups to have an opportunity for individuals to talk about some of the challenges that they face with enforcing the buffer rules, um, but also some methods and ways to, to address some of those challenges. So I'm going to ask if you could take a few minutes to write down on your paper what are some challenges that you face within your local program or with just implementing or enforcing the buffer rules? And after that time, I'm going to share a recording of some of the methods that were shared for addressing some of those challenges that we had within the live training. So please take a moment now to write down and think about some of the challenges that you face. Thank you for taking the time. We're now going to hear from the groups and the live training and the solutions that they came up with. Sure, happy to. Uh, you know, we started we started talking a little bit about, uh, you know, fully understanding both uh, both the limitations of the buffer rules and, and, and what they actually cover. And then we had some, some really good ideas put down related to uh, having pre-application meetings, um, you know, un understanding, uh, you know, how that, uh, uh, that, 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 that the certificates of occupancy can be kind of that last step in, in terms of a development to make sure that uh, the, the buffer rules are, are fully implemented. 
We also had a community that, 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 that spoke up and that doesn't have buffer rules per se, but has setback ordinances and, and uses them in a very similar way, um, you know, to, uh, uh, to, to the buffer rules as, 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 uh, as legislated. So, uh, you know, overall, you, you know, I know that, we, you know, one, one, one person mentioned uh, outreach and education. I know Christy's going to do a presentation coming up here about some of the new tools that, that, uh, uh, that uh, the EQ has developed to, to, to help with uh, education of, of buffers and things like that. So, um, you know, overall, uh, our, our group uh, looked at it from uh, both a standpoint of, of, of how to handle the process and at what point you can use the milestones in the process to, to, uh, to en enact the rules and, and make sure there's full implementation and also how to help, help, uh, help people, uh, you know, citizens and, and developers understand the rules. Great, well, it sounds like you had a really good conversation and we're able to touch on various topics. So thank you, Frank and Frank's group. Um, we will move on to Christy. Yeah, so our group um, talked about a couple of the challenges, such as staffing and um, interestingly improving communication among uh, local regulated entities could be helpful. Um, and then some solutions being education that was brought up several times to organizations and individuals one on one and reasons why. And then a, then a question was brought up, do violations and fines work? And one of our participants said, yes, they work pretty well if you have a Heavy enough fine. So um, some good discussion there. Great, thank you. I'm glad you were able to come up with some solutions to some challenges. All right, now moving on to Patrick's. Hey, we had a couple of comments about education also. So, um, so, so this is perfect that you're doing this, Grace and Christy. Um, and having this out there, but also to have things for non professionals and to have things that show what happens if we don't have compliance. You know, what, maybe it's basic water quality outreach and stuff like that. Um, someone mentioned um, that the more we require documentation or anything that's going on that anyone is going to try to get something done through local government seems to be easier to enforce things. Maybe that's also because they have collected all the correct information ahead of time and, and they've got themselves up to speed. Um, I think that's the only thing that's different from, from some of what you've said or others have said previously. Thank you, Patrick and Patrick's group. And finally, we will go to Lauren. Um, so Mike, feel free to chime in here. Um, but we had a, a discussion talking about a few specific scenarios. Um, we heard from Durham. Durham has a, uh, uh, enforces a 10 foot no build uh, in addition to their buffers. And, um, also, let's see, Hickory has pre-application meetings um, that was shared on our jam board. Um, and then also there was one about uh, requiring a tree protection certification that needs to be submitted. We are now going to hear from our final presenter, Christy Perrin, who will talk about education and outreach and life beyond this webinar. Christy is the Sustainable Waters and Communities Coordinator for Water Resources Research Institute and North Carolina Sea Grant. Christy provides leadership to initiatives that involve multiple sectors and communities in sustainable, sustainably planning, protecting, and restoring natural resources. She earned her master's in public administration from North Carolina State University and has training and experience in facilitation, public engagement, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. She is working to apply a racial equity lens to her professional and personal endeavors. Thank you, Grace, and thank you all for sticking with us. Um, yeah, so it came up in our, our last breakout group that education um, is really important for enforcing and implementing buffer rules. Um, 
So let's jump right into this riparian buffer education strategies. It's gonna be quick. I'm just gonna cover real quickly some of the things I think are really important for um, educating on riparian buffers and other natural resource topics. Um, so let's hear from you first. Um, Grace, can you launch this first poll? Um, and just take a moment to answer this poll for us, please. What do you think would benefit most from education on riparian buffer rules? The number one answer are developers. And number two, it looks like homeowners associations. Um, and number, number two, three would be local officials. It's interesting. We had different answers in our last, um, our last uh, webinar. So that was really interesting to see. So developers and homeowners associations come out on top. Okay. All right. So just imagine that you have um, conducted some education and outreach to your audiences that you have wanted to um, benefit from that. I'm curious in the chat, like, what will people be doing differently? Um, so you've just started your um, education outreach planning by thinking about the, the outcome that you would want um, for your, your efforts, um, what you would like people to do differently. So that's something that you really need to be thinking about. So um, we see here a picture of somebody actually improving a uh, riparian buffer. So maybe she's been educated <laughs> on that already. But anyway, here are my suggestions for moving forward with riparian buffer education, um, a short punch list. Um, identifying your audiences and partners. Uh, so to convince people to take action, we have to um, know our audience, right? Um, and then how best uh, to know your audience than to speak directly with them or somebody from that audience. So get to know them. Um, find and identify and find mutually beneficial goals for your outreach effort with your target audience who are now your partners. Um, create your messages and resources to work toward them and determine together when and how those messages are delivered. Um, and then after you do this, check and see how your, your efforts have gone, tweak it and do it again. So um, let's get into getting to know your, your audience and your partners better. Um, so your homeowners um, or renters in one neighborhood may have completely different views about the creek and vegetation in their backyard than the people in another neighborhood. Um, say your goal is to get people to leave a riparian buffer intact in a modest income neighborhood because they're mowing to the edge. Maybe there's a community leader in this area that you can find to chat with. Um, if you're looking at a different kind of neighborhood um, that has their own property management company, perhaps, um, or if you have large houses on a lake um, or a creek, maybe your goal is to get them to not cut down the trees for their views, right? So the messages would be a little different in this case, right? Um, maybe a homeowners association would be your contact in that situation. So we tend to think in terms of public outreach as this general monolith public, right? So it is helpful to dig in deeper and think about this more specifically about the people that you wanna connect with. Um, so then you can really connect with those. Um, some methods for doing that is to go to that audience. So where do they meet? Um, is there a community organization or an HOA homeowners association group or meeting? Um, are there organizational gatherings in that community that you can attend to share about your program and what you're seeking to accomplish? So you're really trying to seek to understand their views, their reasons for mowing or cutting in this area. Um, and remember as you do this that the lived experience is important. Um, so is the data that you might have, but also people's experiences um, in 
in their environment is important as well. So when you do this, you are acting as an ambassador for your local government. Um, so remember that you can help them to meet their interests by providing the relevant resources, such as are there other departments that can help address their interests. So for example, if they're having stormwater issues or flooding issues um, or wildlife issues, you know, can you share resources or contacts um, to help them deal with those issues as you're also trying to get them to understand their concerns in relation to riparian buffers. So, and I do wanna again say that um, these relationships are important. So building the relationship um, and that partnership is as important as conveying your message um, if you wanna be effective in your education and outreach efforts. <clears throat> So just some examples of uh, potential messages that are more honed based on what you learn from your audiences. And here is where you're trying to find mutually, mutually agreeable goals, <laughs> tongue twister. Um, so for example, maybe they're concerned about losing property due to erosion. Um, and then you might wanna help connect with information about how trees and shrub roots will hold the soil and prevent that from happening. Are they having backyard flooding? Well, information about how riparians can help um, might help address that concern and connecting them with other resources to help, right? Um, fear of wildlife and insects. Maybe there's a community demonstration about wildlife um, to help folks feel more comfortable with that. Um, certainly those types of educational efforts are fun for people. So maybe there's a dual purpose of wildlife, learning about wildlife and riparian buffers. Um, how can vegetation be um, pruned to increase visibility maybe based on what the rules allow and sharing with people what is allowable and how to, how to do that pruning, right? So let's talk a little bit about methods and strategies. Um, certainly one of the good strategies are to partner with trusted messengers to deliver your messages. Um, there are a whole number of organizations that you can work with, um, including community-based organizations like the YMCA, Rotary, nonprofits your county um, cooperative extension and soil and water conservation district um, offices are great um, partners for this. Homeowners, of course, homeowners and neighborhood associations that's been raised already a number of times. Um, there are many realtor associations and boards who might make a good partner. Um, perhaps there's something that could be um, provided with um, sales to properties that have buffers. Um, regional councils of governments. Um, this is a really uh, good resource. Um, many of these programs have uh, environmental um, educational aspects and there are regional stormwater associations um, oftentimes run by regional councils of government. Um, some of them are already doing some riparian buffer education um, and you could partner with them as well. So certainly if there's some existing channels like that, or if you have a stormwater program, if you are a phase two stormwater um, local government, there may be some resources that you already have as far as staff that can help help deliver this messaging. And some specific ideas um, include um, online events right now would be a good thing, like a, a wildlife demo and riparian buffer demo could be an online education um, program. Um, big sweeps and cleanups, there could be some um, education wrapped in there about riparian buffer protection. Um, certainly community science, there's a great state program, Streamwatch, that Lauren Daniel runs. There are probably ways to wrap that in. I think there are some questions on her Streamwatch app about buffers. Um, Creek Weeks, other festivals, um, Enviroscape presentations, um, 
Sometimes soil and water conservation districts do these, sometimes stormwater um, departments do these, and you can focus it on riparian buffer education for, um, and this works for both youth and adults. I've used Enviroscape on adults as well as K through 12. Um, and it's a fun, fun activity to use this model. Social media, of course, and water bill inserts. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can tackle this. And then finally, I want to share about um, some educational resources that have recently been created as part of this project. Um, you can borrow other resources. And actually, I do want to go back up to this Abbott's Creek fact sheet uh, that was created by a, a council of government. Um, I think Danica Heflin, if I'm getting her name right, created these wonderful fact sheets about stream buffers. So there are some resources out there. Um, yeah, that's all I had for my presentation, but I did want to say if you have questions about education and outreach, you are welcome to email me um, or Lauren Daniel um, with Vision of Water Resources. Um, and either of us will be very happy to help you with that. Yeah. So I want to thank you for watching this training today. I hope that you were able to learn something new and that you had some of your burning questions answered. I also hope that you'll be able to apply what you learned today within your local programs. If you have further questions regarding any of the content that you heard today, please feel free to reach out to these presenters. Let them know that this training sent you and I'm sure that they'll answer your questions. Thank you so much and have a great day.